Insekten muss zum Beispiel immer aufstehen und gucken, ob, ob Personen, die um mich herum leben, noch atmen, ob die noch am Leben sind, ob ich selber noch lebe, meinen Herzschlag spüre. Das sind alles ähm, kurz und knapp äh, posttraumatische Belastungsstörungen. In 2017, a German man who goes by the name Marco stumbled across an article in a Berlin newspaper. It showed an image of a professor who evoked intense and traumatic memories for Marco's childhood, Helmut Kintler. Helmut Kintler was known in Germany as a renowned psychologist, sexologist, and professor. To Marco and many other victims, he was known as a monster. Marco's early life was marred by turmoil and unrelenting trauma as he navigated the treacherous waters of foster care, enduring years of unspeakable anguish at the merciless hands of his foster father, Fritz Henkel. The sight of Professor Kentler's face in that newspaper rekindled a wellspring of raw and anguished emotions that Marco had been repressing for years. The article described a research report that investigated something that was called the Kentler Experiment. The Berlin Senate authorized and financially supported Kentler as his program placed neglected children into foster homes run by known pedophiles in the late 60s. In 1988, Kentler even went on to describe this program as a complete success. Marco grew sick to his stomach as he came to the revelation that everything that happened to him in his childhood wasn't caused by some sick twist of fate. They had been orchestrated intentionally. Throughout his childhood, Marco's foster father would frequently take him to Kittler's home. Marco was unaware of the reasons for the visits until now. Overwhelmed by the staggering weight of this revelation, Marco found himself at a loss unable to fully fathom the profound implications of what he just discovered. In an attempt to protect himself from his emotions, he tucked them away and moved forward. Marco now had a family of his own, and his main focus was tending to his family so he didn't feel like he had time to process any of this. In fact, by this time, Marco had grown used to pushing his emotions aside. He had a wall built up. He refused to allow even a whisper of his inner turmoil to escape his lips. It was just too painful to confront. He was actually unemployed at the time because he recently quit his job as a mailman. Whenever he encountered a stranger who made any expressions or even slightly resembled Fritz Henkel, it would trigger him. A feeling of deep sadness, emptiness, and unrelenting darkness would engulf him, making it difficult for him to function. Months after reading this report, Marco finally decided to call Teresa Nentwing. She was the woman who wrote the report. He stumbled over his words as he told Teresa that he was one of the victims of Kentler's experiment. Teresa was shocked to hear this. As far as she knew, the, exper the experiment ended in the 1970s. But according to Marco, he lived in his foster home until 2003 when he was 21. With trembling words, Marco recounted about how his foster father would meet with Kentler regularly and call him weekly. As a child, he never understood why Kentler was so invested in his childhood. Helmut Kentler was born July 2nd of 1928. He was raised by what he described as cold, emotionless parents. His parents followed the teachings of a man named Daniel Gottlob Moritz Schrieber, a German authority on child care that outlines principles of child care that would create a stronger race of men. These principles emphasized suppressing and suffocating emotions. As a child, Kentler yearned for his father's affection, but was met with brutality instead. When Kentler misbehaved, his father threatened to buy a contraption invented by Schrieber to promote children's posture and compliance. The contraption consisted of shoulder bands to prevent slouching, a belt that held their chest in place while they slept, an iron bar pressed to their collarbone so they sit up straight at the table. If Kentler talked out of turn, his father would slam his fist on the table and shout, When the father talks, the children must be silent. Kentler lived through World War II and the reign of Hitler. Post-World War II, 
Nazi principles still prevailed. One principle that had a profound effect on Kentler was the policing of homosexuality. Hundreds of thousands of men were jailed just for being gay. During this time, Kentler himself discovered that he was attracted to men but was fearful of expressing this. He had a fear of going to jail or, even worse, disappointing his parents. He began to become more at ease with the notion of being gay after reading the book Corydon, which discussed the naturalness of queer love. He was quoted as saying, This book took away my fear of being a failure and of being rejected, of being a negative biological variant. In 1960, Kentler got a degree in psychology. He wanted to combine his interest in sexuality with child rearing to create an approach that would alter how German children are reared. He argued that raising boys into the authoritarian type male figures caused them to channel their emotions into destruction. He believed that sexual liberation was the best way to prevent another Auschwitz. His way of thinking wasn't too uncommon at that time. In an attempt to undo the rigid sexual nature of fascism, some people found themselves joining odd movements that lent themselves into various taboos. This time period was marked by a plethora of odd experiments and ideologies centered around sexualizing children. In the late 60s, over 30 German cities established experimental daycare centers where they encouraged children to run around unclothed and explore each other's bodies. There were magazine articles arguing that pedophilia was revolutionary. Some members of Germany's Green Party, a gathering of activists and anti-war protesters, even advocated for abolishing the age of consent, calling it the oppression of children's sexuality. Kentler shone bright in this environment. He led the Department of Social Education at the Pedagogical Center, which is an international research institute in Berlin. He was assigned to work on the problem of runaways, addicts, and prostitutes. This work led him to befriend a young 13-year-old boy named Ulrich. Ulrich was a displaced child whose tragic life led him to a life of prostitution. Instead of feeling bad for Ulrich's condition, and the fact that he was being taken advantage of and failed by society, Kintler was inspired. Ulrich mentioned that he would get food and care from a man that he referred to as Mother Winter. Mother Winter wasn't just giving these homeless kids care from the kindness of his heart. He was providing this care in exchange for sexual favors. Kintler believed that this was acceptable. In his sick and twisted mind, Mother Winter was the ideal father figure. This inspired him to write up a proposition for the Senate. Placing children with pedophiles sounds insane. You would assume that there would be no way the Senate would entertain such a crazy idea, but they did. World War II left over a million children orphaned and homeless. This problem persisted into the late 1960s. They barely had the capability to manage basic government tasks. They didn't have the capability to build a comprehensive care network for the children. It was pure chaos and Kintler was able to take full advantage of this chaos. He used his political connections and was able to get approval and financial funding for his project. Marco was a normal young boy who enjoyed playing in the streets of Berlin. At five, in 1988, he wandered into the street and was hit by a car. He wasn't seriously injured, but the accident grabbed the attention of the Schoenberg Youth Welfare Office, which is run by the Berlin state government. Caseworkers deemed Marco's mother to be unable to give him the necessary emotional attention. She was a single mother working a minimum wage job and was struggling to make ends meet. They would be sent to daycare for 11 hours in dirty clothes. When not in daycare, they were mostly left to their own devices to roam the streets of Berlin. Caseworkers decided it would be best to place him in a foster home where he would be cared for. They described him as a wild boy who was very easy to influence. Marco was placed with Fritz Henkel. 
a 47-year-old single man. Marco was Hinkle's eighth foster son in 16 years. Hinkle's main source of income was the income he received from fostering. He would supplement this income by repairing electronics. When he began fostering in 1973, one teacher noticed and thought that it was odd that Hinkle was always looking for contact with boys. Six years later, a caseworker noted that Hinkle was in a full-on relationship with one of his foster kids. This prompted an investigation, which was quickly intervened by Helmut Kintler. Kintler referred to himself as a permanent advisor and would intervene on Hinkle's behalf regularly. Just to give you an idea of how many complaints there were against Hinkle over the years, there were over 800 pages in his case file of abuse allegations. When Marco first arrived to Hinkle's home, he was awestruck by how nice the home was. It had five bedrooms and was on the third floor of a building in an upscale neighborhood. It was far nicer than the home that he came from with his single mom. There was an armoire in the hallway that held a cage with two rabbits that he could play with. Everything about his new situation excited him. On the surface, it appeared things were finally getting better for him. Unfortunately, this excitement was short-lived. Not long after his arrival, Marco noticed that Hinkle would behave strangely towards him. Hinkle began to touch him inappropriately and would call him into his room to cuddle. Marco didn't know what to think of this. He was quoted as saying, I just accepted it out of loyalty because I didn't know anything else. I didn't think what was happening was good, but I thought it was normal. I thought of it a little bit like food. People have different tastes in food, the way some people have different tastes in sexuality. Ja, der Missbrauch begann ein halbes Jahr nach, nach Ankunft der Pflegestelle unter dem Vorwand, dass es normal sei, gepaart mit äh, psychischen Unterdrucksätzen. Man könne wieder auf die Straße zurück, man kann Müll fressen gehen, äh, keiner will dich und äh, ja, leichte Gewaltanwendung. After about a year and a half, a new child was introduced into the home. He was referred to as Finn. He was seven years old. The police found him sick with hepatitis in a Berlin subway station begging for money. He told the police that he had come from Romania. They noted that Sven had likely never experienced a positive parent-child relationship. When Sven moved in, he was considered the good son, calm, quiet, and loving, a stark contrast to Marco's more defiant nature. When Sven arrived, he was subject to the same abuse as Marco. Each knew what the other was going through. If Sven's door was open and he wasn't there, Marco knew that Hinkle was with Sven. Even though they both knew what was happening, neither of them talked about it. One night, in an attempt to protect himself, Marco slept with a knife under his pillow. Hinkle visited Marco's room as he normally did and discovered the knife. In a panic, he called Kentler. He asked Kentler to speak to Marco. Marco came up with the excuse that the knife was for protection against a devil behind his wall. Kentler calmed him down and convinced him to give up the knife. The effects of Marco's abuse in the home trickled into his life outside of the home. Hinkle banned his family from being able to visit him. His teachers noticed that his performance was declining. He was unable to focus in school, writing letters and numbers backwards. It was so concerning that they repeatedly recommended that Marco see a therapist, but they were blocked from doing so by Hinkle. Marco's family and teachers petitioned for him constantly. A month before Marco turned 10, a hearing was held to petition for changes to be made in regards to Marco's care. Scared and in a seemingly coached response, Marco proclaimed that his foster father, who he called Papa, loved him and his birth family did not. He requested that his family should only visit him once a year with Papa presence and that he was afraid of his biological father. Kentler then requested that contact with the family be suspended for two years due to them being what he called a bad influence. 
After this time passed, Marco's mother was only allowed visits once every few weeks. As time wore on, the meetings became increasingly bad. During one of the meetings, Marco, who was seemingly coached, told his mother that he did not want to see her anymore. Hinkel and Kentler essentially brainwashed Marco into believing that his mother was lazy and that his father was violent. It took decades for him to understand that this was not true and that his parents did try to fight for him. Hinkle would encourage and even reward Marco for acting out in school. This caused Marco to have to switch schools seven times. Presumably, this was done to keep Marco from being at any school long enough for the faculty to be able to grasp that things weren't going well at home. At the age of 18, Marco was finally able to legally move out, but chose to stay for a few more years. The abuse had stopped, but he was so mentally crippled from the years of abuse that he didn't even consider leaving. At this point, he wasn't even able to think for himself. Hinkle went on to adopt more children and Kintler went on to be known as a world-renowned expert on sex therapy. Even after the experiments were over, Kintler seemed to be conducting his own informal version of the experiment. He had several foster sons and three adopted sons. Kentler fully believed that pedophiles were doing their adopted and foster children a favor. Kentler even wrote a letter to his longtime friend and supporter, Gunter Smith, talking about how happy he was thanks to the 13-year love story between him and his adopted son. In his eyes, the relationship was mutually beneficial. His tune changed in 1991 when that same adopted son unalived himself. It was only then that Kindler began to understand that what he was doing was traumatizing and extremely damaging to these children. Kindler then stopped seeing Hinkle. In 1999, he seemed to completely reject his prior beliefs. He was quoted as calling pedophilia a sexual disorder. He also spoke on how the child can never consent to this type of relationship because the adult holds all the power. Kentler passed away in July of 2008. Sadly, many of the mysteries and unanswered questions about his experiments went with him. To this day, the extent of the impact on those involved and the true duration of these experiments remains a mystery.